Hello, Quantum Explorers. And mixed up quarks. Quark, cool. Today I'm going to introduce to you the biggest quark in the world. Can you help me? That's our cat, Quark. And quarks are not the food quark, but quarks are the smallest particles that we know. And this is a big quark. He is pretty big. Welcome back to the Quantum Kid. I am Katya Moskvich, science communicator and theoretical physicist. Hi, I'm Kai, the Quantum Kid, and I really like dogs and cats and small particles. So, Kai, what's going to be so special today about our show? We're going to see a real quantum computer. And what it will be really cool is I'm going to snap my fingers in three, two, one. We're going to go to the quantum lab. Three, two, one. Wait, not Mars. Let's go to the quantum lab. Oh, there we are. Now we're at the quantum lab. What quantum lab is this really again? We are indeed at the ETH Quantum Lab at ETH University in Zurich, Switzerland. And by the way, fun fact, Albert Einstein first studied here and then worked here as a professor of physics more than a century ago now. And Kai, why do you think this lab is special today? Well, because there will be a quantum computer. Well, we are very lucky to be here today and a postdoc researcher, Dr. Anatoly Kulikov, is going to welcome us and show us around. Hello, Anatoly. Indeed. Hello. Hello, Kai. Welcome to the lab. So this is a place where we are trying to realize a useful universal quantum computer using a technology of superconducting circuits, which we refrigerate in this cryostat. Have you seen a, such a cryostat before? Uh, no, but like, where are actually the screens or the keyboards really. The quantum computer itself is this cryostat where the quantum chips are right there in the heart of it, inside. All right? Then, um, so this, so this is just a picture or a photograph of a cryostat open. Right? So quantum chips are here in these um, shields. These are magnetic shields. And this is where we put our samples. Right? Then all of these shiny cables, this is how we control our quantum bits and we control them using room temperature electronics, which is here. And the screens are actually just the screens of classical computers, so they are in the corners of the lab. We don't need to attach a screen right to the, to the computer. So can you maybe explain using um, the picture here mm -hmm. uh, of what's inside the cryostat, how it actually works and where uh, the qubits... What you see outside is actually a vacuum can. So inside this cryostat, the first thing which we do is we create a very, very high vacuum. Do you know what is a vacuum? It's like some where there's no oxygen, but I'm not completely sure. Yes, not, not just no oxygen, but uh, so right now we are, we are breathing atmosphere, right? We are breathing air and uh, there is a lot of pressure and a lot of particles are flying around. Oh, so, like so vacuum is where is none of those particles. The reason why we need to have no air is so we will be able to keep those structures colder and colder. So as a matter of fact, you see, uh, well, our room temperature, we measure temperature in kelvins. In physics, we like to measure from absolute zero, not from zero in Celsius. And uh, we are at, two, uh, at around 300 kelvins. The higher plate of this cryostat is, you see here, it's marked 35 kelvin, and then it goes even below. So here, we are as cold as seven or 10 millikelvin, so it's 10 thousandth of a degree. So it's very, very, very cold. It's negative 273 degrees. That is what we need to cool down our chips, so they actually show quantum effects, and uh, we can actually, well, do some quantum computing. So how do you cool them down to such temperatures? There are two types of helium, helium-3 and helium-4. And uh, effectively, when the helium expands, it can take a little bit of, of uh, heat with it. So we have helium going around in circles here, going around all the way to this, uh, this, small, uh, this small piece. Helium going here con continuously takes heat from outside. And there are several stages. Do you remember what helium does, Kai? Uh, so um, if you who like breathe it in from a balloon from like your birthday party, then you talk like this because it because of the helium reaction. I would not really want to experiment with putting my laptop into a really cold fridge. Yes, that's why we don't put our laptops inside. What we put inside is specially designed chips. Actually, I have one of those chips to show you. Do you want to see one? Yeah. Okay, let's sure. have a look. I think it's it should be near here. So this is called a printed circuit board. And the quantum chip itself is right here in the middle. So can we actually see the qubits on the chip here? Yes, yes, surprisingly we can. You can see the qubits with your bare eye, small patterns and small electrical wires. It's basically squares with qubits in the corners. So there, are, there should be 17 qubits on this chip. I 
actually see the small dots. Exactly. So those small dots, those small small circles and dots, are the qubits. You sh if you count, you will be, be able to count 17 <laughs> of them. The qubits are around micrometers in size, maybe even tens of micrometers, bigger, bigger features. And there are things which are thousands of times smaller. And all these wires are used by us to send signals to our qubit, to our qubits to control them and to read out their state, so to operate the quantum chip effectively. I thought that these were like small particles that you'd store in like bats, and then they'll be like all around flying around. I was not expecting it to be like tiny little wires. What you described can be a technology. It actually is, is one of the technologies for quantum computing. There are different, as we call, platforms. The qubit is already an abstraction, so any qubit is artificially made. It's the question, how do we make them? So we can use our real atoms as qubits, or maybe photons. It's quite easy. Photons are one of the easiest systems to manipulate. Remember what a photon is? Uh, like a light particle. But you know, imagine if inside this crest that there are particles flying in all directions and you, you need to catch them, uh -huh. you need to operate them. That wouldn't be very convenient, would it? No. So that's why uh, people have created this technology where qubits don't try to escape you and they just stand stationary, stand still. You can even see them, right? So they are pretty big. Why do, do you see so many wires here? So these small lines going to the qubits, they are control lines, but we need to still deliver our signals to them, right? And you see the small ports going connectors. Yeah. Here is where we attach wires. Oh, so like that, like that. So this is already a next stage, but yes, absolutely. So these connectors using wires are connected to these things and these things here, and the wires go all the way to the top and then we control this uh, quantum computer, or we control the quantum chip, using uh, room temperature electronics. Could you tell us what's special about this lab here? Because I see that uh, apart from the cryostats, you also have horizontal structures. So I assume mm -hmm, it's something mm -hmm. to do with scaling the technology and just how many of these tiny wires we can actually put on a chip, because at some point it will be just too many, right? So you need to find some solutions how to scale it. A big part of what we are doing in this lab is scaling, let's say, using the, the most standard approach, which is trying to put more of these small wires, more, more of these quantum bits on a single chip. But as you, ha as you see, we need to refrigerate this, we need to put it in a cryostat, and we need to have a lot of these classical wires going inside. So eventually we will, we will come to a limit that we cannot really put more. And for that, we are, we are trying to do another sort of scaling, which is a complementary, and actually it's used incredibly widely in classical computing as well. Uh, which is a parallel, in this case, distributed or parallel quantum computing. This is very, very in its infancy, so the labs like that are only a few in the world. And what you see here uh, is a communication line to another cryostat 30 meters away, where, well, another quantum chip is uh, located inside, and we can send uh, photons to communicate between quantum bits. And uh, this is the main part of what we are working on in this very lab, in this very uh, room. If you can show us how it all integrates with classical computing. We use room temperature electronics to control our quantum bits, but actually our time scales are very, very short. So the pulses, the control pulses we send to control the qubits and perform the computation are as short as nanoseconds. Do you know what is a nanosecond? No, no, first of all, I don't know what a millisecond is. Millisecond is, so what's a millisecond? It's like, uh, so you've got seconds and then and we need 100 milliseconds to have one second. Close enough, 1,000. Oh. 1,000 milliseconds form a second. So if you go yet to a smaller time scales, 1,000 microseconds form a millisecond. So 1 million microseconds form a second. And with nanosecond, it's yet 1,000 times more. So 1 billion nanoseconds form a second. And around 10 or 20 nanoseconds is the length of the control pulses we send. So we can send, uh, I don't know, several thousand control pulse pulses before you can even blink. Obviously we cannot control this with our hands, you know, it's just way too fast and uh, nobody would want to. Uh, so what we do is we program these room temperature electronics from a classical computer. And then we receive the output also on this room temperature electronics, which we later analyze using a classical computer. So quantum computer is not a standalone machine which you I don't know, press buttons or put some sort of uh, helmet with the connection to your mind directly. No, we control it just using the usual classical computer, programming devices, sending pulses, receiving outputs, and seeing the result on the monitor in the way you want. So here you have a monitor, so um, what does it do? Here is where we actually program our devices, our electronics, and uh, actually operate the quantum computer. So we have 
all of this multitude of room temperature devices which send uh, signals which receive signals back, and as I, as I have explained, it all happens on a very, very tiny time scales, so tens of nanoseconds. Of course, it's completely unfeasible for, for a person. So here we have a library. It's a Python-based library. It's a Jupyter notebook. Maybe some of, even some of your younger viewers have used it. We are executing calibration measurements to see if our qubits are even there, if we can send signals to them, if they, if they respond to us. And uh, yeah, and operate the quantum computer from here, basically. So can I control the quantum computer? Actually, you can. So uh, this very quantum computer I have shown you, we are preparing it for the cooldown. But we have more than this one. We have another one in the main uh, in the main laboratory, which is right now cold and operational. So you can. You are in luck. We will do something which is called Ravi oscillation. It's called uh, after a person who actually received the Nobel Prize for his discoveries. It's basically the first calibration measurement we are doing with our quantum bits. Um, we are sending pulses, stronger and stronger pulses, and seeing what the qubits We'll do, but I'll maybe explain this after you see the result. Do you want to press Shift Enter and no, run the cell? Can we also actually change that false to true? Do you know what this false does? Uh, so like it says it no. Says to update. Me. So it won't update now. Okay, I mean we can. You see, you're you're changing a line in a quantum experiment. So press Shift so Enter to run. Shift, shift. Enter. Three, two, one. Ah, look, it does something. It starts the measurement on qubit number three. So let's have a look at the results. So what you have uh, run, the measurements which you have right now executed, remember I have explained you we send the microwave pulses to our humans. Yeah. So you see we, sell, we send pulse and the pulse is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And here when we start the qubit is in the what we call a ground state, in the state zero. And the stronger pulse we, say, we send, the more and more qubit gets excited, it gets into excited state or in the state one. And so you see this oscillation it goes up and then goes down. So why does it actually go down? Yes, very nice observation. So imagine a sphere, and yeah. the, at the bottom of the sphere, the qubit will be in the state zero, and on top of the sphere, the qubit will be in the state one. Yeah. And so as you apply a stronger and stronger pulse, what you do is you rotate the initial state of the qubit along the sphere more and more and more. But what happens if the qubit is already there and you keep rotating? Well, the qubit goes on the other side and gets back to state zero. Oh, that goes down to the like the sphere goes up, and then it goes down. It goes up, then it goes down. Exactly. And it goes up, then it goes down. And then it goes outside and of the screen. Yes. It's very cool, actually. Today, I actually programmed it on the quantum computer. You controlled it, yes. You executed the measurement. Congratulations. How important is it right now to actually come up with new algorithms, in your opinion? I think it's very important. If we create really good and uh, powerful quantum computers, that's great, but then we need to run something on those computers. And right now we don't have so many algorithms. This is a very, very active area of research. And part of the reason why it's an active area of research, it's relatively new. So the whole uh, kind of field of quantum computing started really in the early 90s. And it was maybe a first kind of examples of algorithms which can be faster than classical ones. It's not that quantum algorithms are not good. It's just we have all this classical computing which, if you think about it, has made tremendous and completely crazy progress in the last 60 years, yeah? So the first transistor and the first classical bits were 1950s, end of 1950s, 1960s. And in 1960s, there were maybe eight transistors on a chip, so eight cl classical bits, right? And 1970s, there were a couple of thousands. We are right now somewhere in between, between 1960s and 1970s, but classical computing had, uh, well, 50 more years of progress, and now, the requirement for quantum computing is not just to do something which will be useful or which will be like relatively useful, it's to do something which will outperform uh, the best classical computers. And the best classical computers are very good. They have billions of chips, they have huge data centers uh, c connecting multiple processors, and that is what, uh, what we need to overcome. And that's part of the reason why I don't think that quantum computing as something really useful and widespread will appear sooner than maybe 5 or 10 or 15 years and it's going to be a gradual process. And in this case, of course, people who are working on algorithms are closing this gap from another side. So we are closing the gap from the side of more qubits, better qubits, better performance. And people who work on algorithms are closing this gap from the point of useful algorithms don't require a billion of quantum bits but maybe 100 million, maybe 10 million. Maybe the length of computation is now not 10 weeks, but maybe only one week. Bo both efforts, I would say, are equally as important. 
one of the very interesting things about quantum computing is, uh, which also limits our performance very much, is we cannot copy information in quantum world. And this is part of the reason I've mentioned today also that uh, quantum communication is secure. Well, if, we, if somebody, if your adversary cannot copy information, naturally it's very nice, so you, you can have a uh, secure communication. But when we want to compute something, the fact that we cannot copy information precisely means that we cannot also protect ourselves from errors. So part of the power of classical computation is this is something which is called redundancy. So we have more resources, we have more, um, let's say, more data than we need. And then if some, if some error happens, we can, uh, we can neglect this error, we can counteract it, right? We, we, we can still know what's precise answer, even though there have been some errors. Now in quantum computing, it's much, much, much more difficult and in addition to that, quantum, quantum bits, the qubits I have shown you, uh, they cannot really sustain a computation for a very, very long time. So very quickly they lose, uh, they, they lose their state and the computation is over. And in our times, I've told you that the length of, the, of, of single pulses is maybe tens of nanoseconds. The time of computation which we can sustain is also very short. It's maybe microseconds, maybe milliseconds, but not more than one second. And you know, in one second, there, not, there is not so much you can calculate. Mm -hmm. And one of the very important avenues of research which our lab and many other labs around the world are pursuing is uh, trying to make these lifetime of, lifetimes of qubits much longer so we can sustain longer computations and therefore deeper circuits and of course much more uh, complicated real world problems. Since I'm already programming in Python, mm -hmm. do I need to learn anything else so I can like, program a quantum computer? Knowing Python is already a very good start. As you can see, we are using Python as our programming language of choice to control our quantum computers. I would say it depends on what do you want to work with. If you want to design algorithms, you more would want to learn things such as computer science and uh, still quantum mechanics. I think you need to at least understand quantum mechanics on the basic level to understand how, how quantum computation works. So that probably is inevitable. If you want to work in physics, then and maybe design quantum computers or try to implement these, then well, physics is, is, would be very useful. Uh, engineering, there is really a lot of different subfields and it's more up to your interests and up to your curiosity what exactly do you want to work on. And now there are very nice kits, um, like Qiskit is a language introduced by IBM, which is very accessible. It, it can run on IBM's quantum computer, but it also can, can run on a simulator. It's something which you can use already now to play with the quantum algorithms, very primitive ones. Yes, but you can do that. Um, so I would say Python is a very good start and then you can see which, which direction would you want to follow and specialize there. And of course, the more you know, well, the more, uh, the more interesting things you can discover. Awesome, well, thank you so much, Anatoly. That's been wonderful. And uh, thank, you thank, you for, for yeah, thank you for welcoming us. Bye, Anatoly. Now, if I snap my fingers, we should go back home. In, in three, two, one. Oh, here we are, back to the studio. Indeed, well done, good snapping, Kai. And thank you so much for watching us today. We'll see you again next time on the Quantum Kit for more quantum adventures. And by the way, if you want to study quantum computing further, do consider going to various quantum events, like for instance, there is Quantum Tech Europe happening in Rotterdam this year, and there are lots of other interesting conferences. Also, if you want to learn how to program on a quantum computer, do subscribe to our webinars, which we're actually launching this month. And don't forget to click that like button so it dings up. And also don't forget to click that big subscribe button as well. And we'll see you again next time. Thank you and goodbye. Bye.